Hello, my name is Peter Murphy. I'm president and CEO of the Illinois Association of Park Districts. And I am honored today to be talking to a park and conservation legend in the state of Illinois, Oscar Dow. Oscar served as a park commissioner from 1987 to 2007 for the Northbrook Park District. He is also a former president of the Illinois Association of Park Districts, having served in 1999, the same year he achieved master board member status. He is also the, the recipient of the Outstanding Commissioner of the Year Award, which he received in 2000. Oscar, it's great to be here with you today. Great to be here with you, Peter. Thank you for spending the time, a little time with me today. I'm always a pleasure to be in your company. How would you describe yourself? Well, you know, that's a question that people ask uh, me quite often, and I try to relate it to uh, the Scout Oath. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, there's 12 points in the Scout Oath. I do. And uh, I believe that all of those uh, points have something of value to me, and that's the type of person I am. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And I believe that that kind of, I know that's a lot of words, but well, that's basically me. Well, those words say a lot. I, were you involved in scouting? Yes, I was. I was a Boy Scout, became a uh, life scout, uh, and I was one merit badge short of being an eagle, and then I discovered girls, and that was the end of becoming an eagle scout. <laughs> so uh, then I uh, was a scout master for a uh -huh. number of years uh, before I became a commissioner. Oh, in really? fact, had three boys uh, that became eagle scouts, and uh, happy to say my uh, grandson became an eagle scout last year. So. Yeah, I've had a big history with Boy Scouts. Well, that's fantastic. You know, I have too. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout, and both of my sons are Eagle Scouts. So it's something to be very proud of, and I know that it makes a difference when employers are looking at your resume. Uh, scouting still has a big impact on how people perceive you and the kinds of qualities and character you bring to uh, any organization. No question. No question about that. Uh, and uh, it, my son had an experience like that where he went in for a job interview down in Fulton, Missouri, and the uh, guy looked at it and said, you mean you're an Eagle Scout? He said, you got the job. So you're absolutely right. That's wonderful. My yeah. son had a similar experience as well, so that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. So 20 years as a park commissioner, when you started, what motivated you to be a park commissioner the very first time? Well, the very first time was uh, as I was a president of the uh, Northbrook uh, Civic Foundation, which uh, has been a big supporter of the Park District for years. Uh, and uh, there had been a rumble uh, that uh, the Park District no longer wanted the foundation to hold their festival in the Village Green Park. So uh, the board, uh, we were sitting around one night and said, hey, maybe we better get somebody on that uh, park uh, board. Uh, so uh, we looked around the room and uh, two of the guys were already on the village board and a couple others were doing some other things so well Oscar it looks like you <laughs> so uh, the uh, I went to interview we, we have a caucus system up there and mm -hmm. uh, lo and behold they uh, selected me to uh, run for the park board. Uh, fortunately, uh, I got enough votes to get on the board. Uh, but it's, uh, after I got on the board, it became uh, second nature. Uh, I'd been a volunteer all my life. Mentioned the Boy Scouts sure. before, Scoutmaster. Had been on the United Fund board, uh, was president of the Civic Foundation. So it was kind of a natural thing. But I've always felt you had to give back to the community, mm -hmm. and this was another way of uh, giving back to the community by serving on the park uh, board. But that's basically why I got on the park that's board. That's great. What do you think makes the uh, is a philosophy of a good park commissioner? You're in a you're in a position where you're serving. Um, it's a volunteer position. Uh, you're serving with other individuals uh, that you need to get along with for good governance. So what what's, would be the philosophy that you think a park board member should have? Well, what was I, your philosophy? My philosophy was to listen, mm -hmm. to question, to have a uh, argument period where you argument your, uh, argue your side and listen to the other side. 
and then you come to an agreement and then you all uh, go out together and you go as a, not as an individual but as a group mm -hmm. because it's a group uh, that makes the decisions and uh, what's in the best interest of the community uh, so that's basically was my philosophy was to make sure I got along with my fellow commissioners. That's good. That's important, I think, uh, to good governance, no question about it. Without a doubt. Uh, what tips or thoughts would you share with somebody who was a brand new commissioner for the very first time? Well, I would, the first thing I would say to them is be yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, then I would say uh, get educated about uh, park districts. Uh, make sure that uh, you participate with IAPD because that's where you do get your education about park districts. Uh, I also would uh, tell them that uh, you have to get along to go along. So you have to get to know your fellow commissioners. Mm -hmm. And you have to not always be the outsider. You have to be somebody who, you got good ideas, Bring your ideas forward, and uh, if they get shot down, hey, you come back the next day and you have another idea. Uh, not everybody's ideas are always the perfect idea. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of uh, being a good person, there's no doubt about that, and getting along with your fellow commissioners. So you really have to be open to... Um Rejection a little bit, I guess. Oh, no question about uh, that. Because the board is making the decision as a group, and so um, you know, being able to accept, if you will, defeat on one idea will give you the opportunity, if you do that graciously, to come back with a, another idea that everybody might embrace. Well, we had a seven-person board, and I always used to tell the new commissioners that came on, you learn to count to four in a hurry. <laughs> Because when you have four people that already have their opinion formed, you're, you're very seldom going to change that for. Mm -hmm. So you go, they won. Uh, don't feel bad about it. Go along with it. And then you come out as a majority so that the community feels that the board is working harmoniously instead of having bad feelings between commissioners. Because when that happens, then your community is suffering because the board has got to get along. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, it's all about math. A five-person board, you've got to count to three. Well, yeah, divisiveness among boards uh, really plays out poorly, I think, in the community because people want to uh, know that things are being achieved, but they also want to know that people have respect for each other and uh, you know, are willing to, willing to you know, take other ideas Correct. into consideration. Correct. Very important. So we live in a state, which is very interesting. We have a number of park districts, so they're special districts. Uh, the nation has a number of special districts that deliver park and recreation services, but probably not to the extent that uh, park districts uh, are in Illinois. Do you think park districts are a, a better delivery system than a, a delivery system of municipal parks and recreation? And if so, why? Short answer, yes. Uh, the long answer, uh, why? is uh, separate taxing bodies able to uh, have their own ability to uh, raise their funds through taxes. Also, uh, I believe that being a separate uh, board versus being uh, part of the village, it's easier for the consumer or your resident to talk to the park district commissioner than it is to go through the village uh, board. Uh, park district commissioners, in my experience, have been open, above board, and are willing to talk to their resident that sometimes you don't get out of the village. Uh, the larger the governmental agency is, the more difficult it is for the resident to be able to get satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, that, to me, is the big issue. Uh, the second issue, when the uh, village would be uh, running the park districts. Uh, you have a, uh, what I wanna say is a secondary involvement with park districts. The, the recreation activities in those districts 
tend not to be as good is a separate taxing body issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, those would be the big reasons I would uh, say that uh, a separate park district does so much better than uh, one underneath the village. So in your 20 years, I imagine you were pretty accessible to people in the community. They'd see you out in public and might let you know what they thought about uh, the park district and oh, its without operation? A, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Uh, uh, most of my, uh, you know, I was active in the community. Mm -hmm. I, I made a living in the community. And so people would stop at my office and talk about the park district, uh, which was not a problem for me. So, uh, yeah, uh, you definitely have to be uh, available. That's great. That's interesting. Um, I think you also uh, made a good point about uh, trying to move the needle with an elected board as far as influencing them. If you're in a county system or a village system, it might take hundreds of residents where I imagine in a park district uh, board meeting, if you had 15 people in the audience that really wanted to see some change being made, that you'd be responsive to them, right? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say that uh, the majority of park districts that are separate from villages, uh, you definitely give your resident a better opportunity to speak at a meeting than uh, the village would, mm -hmm. no doubt about One it. One of the other things that I've noticed about elected park boards is that, and your terms were uh, four or six years in North Brooklyn. Four years. Four years. You have a long-term view of things in your community, and I know that one of the things that the Northbrook Park District did uh, with your leadership was acquire the last open space in the community. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, actually, uh, during my time on the board, uh, we, we, we actually uh, secured two different referendums to secure open space. Uh, the first one, we secured 50 acres uh, from the uh, high school which we're going to build a third high school there. We uh, w uh, made an agreement with the high school to buy the property from them. We uh, went out to referendum. Uh, the people uh, had not supported a referendum for many years in Northbrook, mm -hmm. but that one they overwhelmingly supported, and now it's uh, an additional nine-hole golf course uh, on our 18-hole sportsman's golf course. The one that you spoke specifically of was the purchase of the Annitzberger property, whereby we got 65 acres, and uh, that one we went out to referendum again. Uh, the cost of the property at that time was $250,000 an acre. Not quite sure if we were going to uh, be successful, but if you craft your referendum properly, mm -hmm and you get support from a lot of groups of people. And in this one, we specifically uh, got the environmentalists aboard. We got the golfers aboard because we we're gonna have a little nine hole golf course there. We also got our soccer players, our baseball players, our skateboarders, because this park was gonna include all of those things. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, a huge number of people who were supportive from various organizations, we overwhelmingly won uh, the referendum and purchased that property. And now uh, I think it's one of the finest parks in Illinois. I'm a little biased, of course, but we do because we hooked up to one of our other uh, uh, parks. We are the only park district in Illinois that has a bike velodrome, Oh, have a skateboard park, which is one of the best in-ground skateboard parks in America. Uh, we have uh, soccer fields that, that when we built that thing, we originally put AstroTurf type uh, in there. So it's used year round. Mm -hmm. We have uh, ball diamonds in there. We have, like I said, a par three uh, golf course. We have a huge environmental area where people can uh, walk, uh, visit the plants and animals and that. Uh, have a sled hill in there. Have, uh, uh, like I, I mentioned, uh, environmental area that is unique to our area. So it's there's only one other park that I've seen in Illinois like that, and that's down in 
by St. Louis, Illinois. St. Well, Louis. there's a lot going on. There's no question. It yeah. sounds fantastic. Yeah, it is. And that was, the public supported it tremendously. Well, and just to protect that acreage, when you think of buying a, an acre of property for 250000 people might blanch at that at first, particularly um, when they look at, you know, what property costs if you're buying some farmland down in southern Illinois. Correct. But really, you're saving that for the future, and, you know, what would Chicago be without uh, its park system? So now Northbrook has a park district that's unparalleled as well. Well, and... Uh that property would sell for a half a million dollars this year. Sure. So uh, it, it was a bargain when we look at it in that regard, if mm -hmm. you look backwards at it. Yeah. You've had uh, a lot of great professional leadership of the Northbrook Park District. And I'm curious as to what you would think or what advice you'd give to young professionals as to the, the right mix of attributes to be a good executive director at a park district. Well, I think the, a good uh, park district executive director has to have a vision, has to be able to see the future, mm -hmm. has to be able to understand uh, his, their community that they work in. What, what, not every community is the same. Some communities are more sports oriented. Some communities are more theater and uh, arts uh, uh, orientated. So a person who wants to be a uh, executive director has got to have a vision, then he's got to be able to understand the community that he's in, then he's got to be able to work with five or seven diverse personalities and be able to put them together so that they're all on the same uh, track. And then that individual also has to be able to work with the other governmental agencies that are within sure. the uh, community because you're in a partnership. You're working for everybody in town. You're not just working for those people who use the park right. district. You're working for everybody. So <clears throat> the, the executive director has to be somebody who can combine those things all into his own personality and then go out and do the job. Great, great uh, advice for uh, young people that want to be an executive director, no question about it. What do you think some of the challenges are that are facing park districts today? Well, the first one's money. Mm -hmm. Second one is land. And the third one is uh, uh, people who want to work in the uh, park uh, field. And the fourth one would be people who want to volunteer. Uh, I see uh, money is the big issue, uh, especially in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, which is broke as of today. Uh, and uh, the issue becomes we're not able to tax as much because you have some restrictions on your ability to tax. So that means you've got to raise some funds through fees. Mm -hmm. So you have to be uh, smart in how you structure your program so you are able to get the fees sure. to offset the tax dollars. Then uh, communities, especially north of uh, I-80, uh, have land issues. Land is not available sure. for them to, uh, to purchase or anybody giving them land today, so it's difficult to expand your programming activities if you don't have the proper land. I think also that there's an issue today of people, uh, employment of uh, people going into the field of parks and recreation. Uh, it's not as um, uh, glamorous as a number of other uh, fields are. So I think there's gotta be a better educational motivation for uh, people to go into parks mm -hmm. and recreation. Uh, and then I think volunteerism, uh, I've noticed uh, over the years, <clears throat> it's harder to get people to volunteer. Uh, and there's a, a number of reasons why, sure. you know, they're all working two jobs and, uh, and whatever. So that's, a, I think, a really big issue because to me, volunteers are what make uh, parks really go. It's the mothers who uh, bring their kids to the games, it's the fathers who coach, it's uh, a combination of all those things and so there's got to be a, 
a, a strong educational push to both push to bring volunteers into the programs and push to bring people uh, educated into the programs. That's a great point because volunteers really, park districts rely on a lot of volunteerism. They couldn't do it just with their own staff. And Correct. So the dedication of dads that step up and coach and other people and moms that are participating in various ways is really critical to the success of the delivery of those programs. Well, Northbrook, uh, the last time I looked, had over 750 volunteers uh, providing uh, help to the professionals. So it's, it's necessary. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, the diminution of that would, would have a big uh, impact, I think, on Park District's ability to deliver services. Oh, no question. No so, question. That's a good point that we need to encourage that. So I know you're a gentleman that uh, provides good advice. You've given me good advice during my career. What advice would you give to a 20-year-old? I would say stay in school, uh, give yourself a good education, go into Parks and Rec because it's a great job, it's a great place to interact with people if you like people. Uh, it's, it has uh, all the benefits of um, uh, health, welfare, it has uh, pensions uh, that not everybody gets today. Mm -hmm. uh, the divine benefit plan that parks and recreation people get, who else gets it except other governmental workers? Nobody in the uh, uh, workplace other than governmental agencies gets a divine benefit pension. You got the 401ks or whatever it happens to be. So if you're looking for the future, that should be a, play at a big part in a decision that you might make as to what field you want to Part go of in. your consideration. Then. No question about it. Um, it's interesting to me um, when you think about uh, a kind of a career in public service, uh, what's your major contribution to Parks and Recreation, do you think? What's been my major mm -hmm. contribution? <clears throat> well, the one of the biggest ones that I, uh, I've feel very proud about when I was president of the IAPD in 1999, started a, a tree planting program. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunate enough to plant the first tree on the, uh, down in Springfield on the governor's lawn down there. Uh, and uh, I think over time uh, we probably planted over 200,000 trees. We have. And that uh, in itself helps the environment tremendously. Uh, the second uh, things that I feel that I brought to uh, the Parks and Recreation was, and we spoke about it before, was the purchase of land for uh, the Northbrook Park District, which I happen to have been uh, the leader on both of those activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, the other thing that, uh, that I'm really proud of is that we were able to bring our board together. Uh, when I first got on my, our board, we were contentious. Mm -hmm. We were uh, at each other's throats for various reasons. And uh, over a period of uh, several years, we were able to bring that together. You give a little bit, you get a little bit. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I'm proud of in Northbrook is when I got on the Northbrook Park District, they were broke. They didn't have enough money to buy an electric oh, typewriter. Right. right. Uh, now uh, they've got surpluses that they never had before, uh, primarily because uh, we did pass several referendums. We were able to roll bonds. We were able to resell bonds, get a better interest rate. So we brought some uh, stability as far as the finances are concerned. Good to financial the management then. No question about it. And those are the things that I'm proudest of. Plus, uh, the people I've met in Parks and Recreation have become friends. And uh, that uh, I'm extremely proud of, that I was able to ma meet people that have become lifelong friends. Which kind of leads me into my next question is, why should somebody become involved in IAPD? Well, I think, uh, uh, when I think of that question, I think of the EPA. And I'm not thinking of the Environmental Protection Agency. 
I'm thinking of IAPD as education, public policy, and advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nobody that I'm aware of that gives better education to members of their organization than IAPD. When you think of all the educational classes that you can get at a conference or ones that are held quarterly or monthly throughout the state, uh, unbelievable or to me uh, uh, the education that I got from attending conferences from people who are professionals and people who are volunteers also mm -hmm. that sure. they're holding these educational classes. And then the public policy that uh, IEPD has done for the parks and the recreational field over the years. Uh, pretty tough to beat the record that uh, Peter Murphy has as a uh, advocate for parks and recreation with all the legislators. Well, that's nice of you to say. Uh, well, it's the truth. I only speak the truth. And then uh, advocacy. They advocate, uh, IAPD advocates for everybody. They don't leave anybody out. And uh, I think that's an important uh, factor in why people should become uh, very active with IAPD. And you'd mentioned lifelong friendships. And I've heard other people speak of that, that you meet people throughout the state of Illinois that you would have never met had you not been involved with uh, IAPD because it brings you together with commissioners of other park districts that uh, turn out to be lifelong friends. Correct. Uh, the, the first uh, friend that I made uh, by going to an IAPD function was interviewed just before I was interviewed here. I was standing in the Sangamo Club and just after talking to uh, Grace Mary Stern, our representative from Highland Park, and this white-haired gentleman walked over to me and he said, hey, I'm Fred Honky. Who are you? I said, well, I'm Oscar Dahl. <laughs> he says, uh, are you active in uh, IEPD? I said, well, not really. This is the first time I come to one of these things. He said, well, you ought to get on a committee. So the next thing you know, I'm on a committee. Here I am 28 years later, I'm still going to lunch with this guy. And he buys every once in well, a while. Well, that's good. <laughs> right. That's the benefit of that lifelong friendship. No that, question. That's awesome. Yeah. That is a great tribute, I think. Well, it is, and uh, that's the type of people you meet. Sure. Because everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but generally most people who are involved in parks and recreation as a commissioner are there because they're wanting to do good for their community, right. and they're a good kind of people. Right. And that's really the type of people you want to associate with. Absolutely. I mean, if you want to have a good life experience, you should always associate with people that are uplifting. And I think you're right. I think park commissioners are an amazing group of people because they really do run for the right reasons and they stay. The longevity of uh, park board members is tremendous because I think they really enjoy what they're doing and they see uh, the gentleman that you'd mentioned, Fred, had mentioned about how he's moving his community forward with the kinds of recreational opportunities there are. And that really trumps, uh, I think, in, in your statement about, well, this is what I did with land acquisition. And we were able to save this land that's now one of the best parks uh, clearly in the state of Illinois. Correct. So I think that really is important. There's no doubt about it. Right. So you told me what advice that you'd give a 20-year-old. What's the best advice you ever received? Well, uh, do I have the ability to give two? Absolutely. Okay. You can give as many as you want. The first one that I received, I was about 10 years old. And my uh, scoutmaster said, Asker, you have to leave the place a little better than how you found it. And that has stuck with me all my years. I'm going to be 81 years old here pretty soon. And... Uh, I still practice that today. Mm -hmm. Try to leave the place a little better than I found it. And when I became, when I was a park district commissioner, that was my philosophy. Try to leave this place a little better than how it was when I came in. I think I've done that. Uh, secondly, the best, second best piece of advice I got, I was 24 years old and uh, I was on my really first job as a salesman and I was going to be an insurance salesman and this fellow uh, salesman said ask her you gotta save 10 percent of everything you earn 
And I thought, you know, that makes sense. And all my life, I have saved 10% of everything I earned. Is that right? It's absolute gospel. And as I sit here today, I'm still saving 10% of everything that comes in. Uh, and uh, so those are the two of the biggest things that have helped me and have motivated me throughout my life as a person. That's fantastic. Yeah. What do you see for the future of Parks and Recreation? Well, I see uh, the future is always unlimited, but there is some limitations today because of the financial situations that happen uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, but parks uh, and parks uh, people have been resilient, mm -hmm. been able to overcome a lot of uh, things that have happened uh, over the years. Uh, so I see uh, a bright future. I see, uh, yeah, they might not move as fast as they had been uh, for a few years, but in general, I think that uh, the park, uh, the one thing that I see where there's a big uh, possibility for the parks to do greater than what they're doing now is in the mature adult and the senior citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say mature adult, I'm talking about people that are 50 years old and older. Most of them have raised their children uh, by then or they're in college, the last remaining few. So <clears throat> I don't see parks doing as good a job as they should be with that age bracket. I don't see them doing as good with seniors as they should be. Uh, so there's a, there's a big opening for uh, parks and recreation to do so much more in those age brackets than they are now. Uh, I think parks are uh, losing them to uh, regular health clubs, mm -hmm. uh, things in that order. Uh, and uh, I think parks uh, have got to start looking at the mature adult and senior citizen in a more serious vein than just playing cards and, you know, uh, that, that type of stuff. Uh, they've got to do more. Well, and the demographic is growing uh, quickly, so, uh, and, and older adults want to be active, so I think that's the key. I think when we think of senior citizens in the past, we think of people coming together and playing cards right. at a recreation center, and that's not the active senior today. No. Here, look at I'm a senior, 81 years old. I played golf three times this week. Uh, that's and, what and I you shot your age, right? Shot my age twice. So uh, the, the uh, issue is uh, we have the mindset. I, I tell people that, hey, listen, I'm 80 years old, but I think I feel like I'm 50. I think like I'm 20. My wife says I act like I'm 13. <laughs> so one guy said to me, well, what does this 20 mean? And I said, well, what were you doing when you were 20? He says, well, I says, I was drinking beer, chasing girls, and driving fast cars. And I said, well, now that's what I think I'd like to be doing. <laughs> I can only do two of them. I can drive the fast car and can drink the beer, but I couldn't chase the girls anymore. Yeah. But that's how people my age sure. think. You know, 80 is the new 50, right. in my opinion. Now, if a person is sick and, and unable to do things, that's something different. But uh, as long as... As long as the great medical advances are being made, mm -hmm. that are being made today and the medications and all that, people can do marvelous things at 80 or 90 years old. Sure. You know. Well, that's amazing. Well, you're certainly a testament to that, I'll tell you. That's... Well, uh, modern medicine has kept me alive for the last eight years. Uh, you know, I had went through a bout of... Uh, uh, leukemia and uh, got into a uh, <coughs> uh, up to Mayo Clinic. I got myself into a tr clinical trial. New drugs saved my life. It's fantastic. And the drugs they used on me are old now. They got new drugs that are even better. So there are amazing things that happen, and that's why I say that people 
who are mature adults, we should be working out with them more. Well, that's a great uh, message, I think, for park districts across Illinois to do that. And I know that, uh, you know, the move is afoot to uh, really respond to that demographic in a way that they never have before. Well, I think, I think that's wonderful because it, uh, uh, you get a lot of volunteers out of that age group, too. You bet. Yeah. How would you like to be remembered as a park commissioner? I'd like to be remembered uh, very, uh, in a short sentence, uh, he cared about his community, cared about his family, cared about his friends, and he cared about uh, everybody. Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, I know that people will remember is that, Oscar Dahl, you've made a difference, and it's a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. It's my it's honor. Always, it's always a privilege and a pleasure to talk to a Michigander, and uh, I hope that uh, Harbaugh does well for you. <laughs> well, he can't do worse. Thank you very <laughs> yeah. much. Okay. Thank you.